<laughs> Carnival is a 1998 arcade rail shooter by Midway Games. The fact it was released on Halloween says a lot, as it quickly became known for its graphic violence and dark humor. Carnival is an over-the-top wild ride through a supernatural carnival complete with park rides, a haunted house, a freak show, and lots and lots of clowns. <laughs> Carnival is the brain baby of Jack Hager, who thought up the initial idea back in 1988 while working on the infamously violent NARC. Some years later, he was able to get the idea approved by Midway. The game originally resembled something closer to Disney's The Haunted Mansion, with a distinctively lighter tone. Midway's management hated it, and the idea was revamped into a much darker but more comedic tone. The team working on the game were under the impression that the project was going to be cancelled at any moment, so they had a lot of fun in creative freedom when designing the very large roster of enemies. Pressured by the success of the gore-filled Mortal Kombat series, the team greatly increased the intended blood and gore, which only added to the dark humor of the game. This led to them adding a dip switch so arcade owners could utilize an optional censored version of a particular boss, but we'll get to that in due time. Let's have some fun. Before we begin proper, let's take a quick look at the attract demos. Naturally, we have the typical pre-recorded gameplay and leaderboard screen, the latter of which we'll talk about later. We also have a painful to read content warning and an adorably simple music video trailer. The main event though, and the thing most likely to grab the curious passerby, is the pre-rendered opening cutscene that plays as one of the demos. When the moon is full and trees are bare, walk through the cemetery if you dare. Where skeletons rot and corpses fester. Locate the tomb with the skull of a jester. Feed him the token all shiny and new. It is then that Carnival will return for you. Funny enough, I have the opening poem memorized, though I never took the time to practice. Going from this cutscene, we are playing as a thrill seeker who purposely invokes the curse of Carnival. Whether he bit off more than he can chew is another story, but I think it adds character to everything if this is all our fault. Starting the game proper, we are immediately thrown into this level select screen. You can play the first three levels in any order, however the final level must still be unlocked afterwards, so there is incentive to complete them all in a single session. Now, I myself, and a surprising number of other people, have a traditional order to the levels. Rickety Town, The Haunted House, and then The Freak Show. There isn't any particular reason for this order, it just seems like the right way to play and I was genuinely surprised when I found out this was a common sentiment. So, for our own journey, we'll be picking Rickety Town first. What goes up must come down. Now you're headed for Rickety Town. Ride all the rides, have some fun, then eat your heart out on a sesame seed bun. <laughs> this is Umlaut. He's probably what everyone remembers most about this game, and I think he's an absolute treat. He probably goes a long way to creating the fever dream nightmare atmosphere of the game, and there is a reason he was featured in all the game's marketing. 
Even now, he opens all the levels with a fun poem and scenery-eating cutscene. And I think it sets the horror-comedy tone perfectly, regardless of what level you choose. Heading on down to Rickety Town, as the name suggests, this area is focused on rides and a more traditional theme park aesthetic. What's not suggested by the name is the Christmas theme. Yeah, for whatever reason, the start and end of this level is themed after Secular Christmas, complete with elves, <laughs> presents, snow, and a particular boss we'll talk about in due time. This was likely because, since this game was released on Halloween Day, Christmas was the holiday most likely to take place immediately after the machines were purchased, shipped, and installed at arcades. Though, I am a bit surprised they didn't reference American Thanksgiving anywhere to cover the whole holiday trio. Anyway, let's ride this roller coaster up, though we'll need to jump off before the car goes off the track. Elves are better described as green goblins, and they'll throw presents and hit you with candy canes. If you shoot them just right, you can remove their upper half and leave cartoony legs behind. To back them up are these giant wasp termite flies who will fly out of cracks in the rides. Now that we've made it to the top of the coaster, we can't exactly follow the track. So instead, we jump into the neighboring Ferris wheel style ride. This is the Big Bunyan ride, and for whatever reason, this ride has its own theme song. This, plus the realistically cheesy Paul Bunyan statue, shows you just how much fun was had during the making of this game. When we reach ground level, we hop off into a general ride area. We are greeted by Mr. Smiley's, first name Bob, and I'll get into detail about him later. For now, we can pick up this acid and spray them down. That's right, this game has ammo-based pickups, and I'm pretty sure the acid is hypothetically the best one. However, it's hard to test since power-ups are in very carefully placed locations. Acid will one-hit kill all enemies and will continue to spray as long as you hold down the trigger, so you'll want to barely tap on the fire button to maximize the number of shots. If you pick up the second acid, it can get you decently far through the Dino-Rama ride. As the name suggests, it's dinosaur-themed, complete with spinning eggs and grungy looking mascots. While I would have appreciated a flat out dinosaur with clown makeup on over these Barney rejects, it's still a surprising positive to see a prehistoric reference like this. Stepping off the ride, we reach the food court. I wouldn't trust the food here. Underpaid teenagers take their anger out on you by throwing food and making crude gestures. You even dump this little idiot into the fryer. The whole section is hilariously juvenile and for the time was rather tame. <laughs> We move on to the bumper cars. The Smiling Bobs return and appear to be native to this ride, as they are themed after gas station attendants. Like most enemies, they have a surprising amount of character to them, saying specific lines when they hit you, Hi, I'm Smiling Bob, your friendly service man. or you hit them. Like the Big Bunyan ride, the bumper cars also have their own music, which plays as you drive about the arena. To simulate driving, the camera is purposely floaty, while smiling bobs try to hit you with their own vehicles. It emulates bumper cars pretty well, though the player character drives less chaotically than one would think, and it isn't a particularly long section. I suspect that was to minimize any potential motion sickness from people with weaker stomachs. Realizing they are no match for you, the bobs will direct the player to a wall, which the player character will proceed to smash through with no hesitation. What do you know? We've made it back to the coaster from the beginning of the level, though now we're on the part of the track right after the drop. We hop back into the car, marking the return of the elf and wasp combo. We go up a hill, through some hoops of fire, and this time we actually get to ride the coaster to its finish. Time for our first boss. Our first boss is... Evil Santa? Look, I know Krampus can be terrifying in specific folktales, but with this being more Santa than Alpine Karma Demon, I can't help but question Carnival's decision to incorporate Christmas themes. Elves and a single coaster is one thing, but an entire boss? 
Oh well. Ignoring broader context, Krampus is a decent but simple boss. Which is probably a good thing as he's the boss most people are likely to encounter first. Shoot him in the chest, as one is prone to do, and eventually he'll strip away his skin to show his heart and skull. That's pretty much it from the player. While this is happening though, Krampus will rake you with his claws, hit you with his bag, and eventually throw hot coals at you. Most, but not all attacks can be cancelled out with enough timed hits. On a timer, regardless of any damage you do, the player character will occasionally switch locations in the arena. We'll fight Krampus in front of a giant Christmas tree, around the skating rink, up one of the sets, and back to and around the Christmas tree on a loop. Killing Krampus early in the fight isn't difficult, but killing him at the intended location gives the death some nice framing via the backside of the tree. By the way, you can continue to shoot bosses during the score screen and death scenes, and their corpse will react to your gun. Let's head to the haunted house next. Welcome to the haunted house. It's a ghoul who lost her head. If you'd like to stay and join us, you're always welcome, alive or dead. <laughs> The Haunted House is probably what most outside people think of when imagining rail shooter games. In fact, this level was probably the reason why some gaming magazines called Carnival House of the Dead clone. A rail shooter with zombies? Must be trying to rip off House of the Dead! Games journalism, ladies and gentlemen. Well, the zombies, and the flying bats and ghosts who accompany them, are only in this one level. Though I will admit, the game makes the most of them. Most zombies will come up to slap you, but occasionally some will throw items instead. You can shoot these away, but when they throw their lunch, you might have to hit it a few times. It seems the ride cars are out of service, so we'll be walking through this attraction instead. As we enter the house, we are met with a mid-boss, Hambone. This is where the game steals all your quarters. Hambone just rips you apart with his chain gun, and there is no way to avoid all the damage he does. Even with two guns laying into him full blast, he can easily take off half or more of a full bar of health. I would never recommend a new player start with the haunted house level, specifically because of this asshole. If you survive to the end of his battle, or just long enough for the animation to loop, the game rewards you with the shotgun power-up. Your shots now do a heavy amount of damage with decreasing returns the further away the enemy is. It's pretty solid for a video game shotgun, and it works exactly how you would expect it to. They even put a second shotgun power-up down for the second player to take. We now make our way through the manor, which is decorated exactly how it would want a theme park haunted house to look. A gothic fireplace, walls covered in slightly edited paintings, and trap doors filled with bats. Be careful as you take care of the monsters, though. This is Betty. She may or may not be our girlfriend, and she apparently got pulled into Carnival after us. If you save her, you don't get anything. But if you accidentally shoot her, then you lose health. As we tour the house, ghosts and large spiders will start coming out of the furniture. If you keep an eye out, this level has hearts that restore health and a power-up that increases your clip size. Past this hallway of clawing arms is a machine gun power-up. You can now rapid fire at the cost of doing slightly less damage. The trade-off is worth it, especially for one-hit small enemies like the spiders. However, it might be better to save it for our next mini-boss fight. Hambone is back and angrier than ever. Thankfully, he doesn't eat away our health with his chain gun this time. Instead, he fires these floating skulls. They can be shot away, but honestly, they often miss on their own. In fact, they often get lost on where they're supposed to go. If you shoot Hambone carefully here, not only can you do the typical removal of flesh from bone, but you can also remove his mask. After all, Hambone is a parody of Jason Voorhees. Either way, Hambone is much more of a fair fight here, and will go down easy enough. <laughs> Moving on, let's see what's in the kitchen. Well, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't expect the zombies to be cooking. I like to imagine them yelling Chef Ramsay memes at me when they attack. No! 
We eventually catch up to Betty, but she is quickly taken away by a giant spider. Adding that to the list of moments of when she totally dies and it's not our fault. Following after her, we are ambushed on all sides by the giant spiders. Larger forms of the common spiders, the best way to kill them is to shoot off all their legs on one side. As long as they have at least one leg on both sides, they'll stay alive. But if you clean off one side, they won't be able to use their walking animations anymore and will just die. We slip behind a painting into the attic and up onto the roof. We have toured nearly the entire house, haven't we? I wonder how many bathrooms they have and what the starting price is. We'll definitely need to get it fumigated though. And just as we are enjoying the rooftop view, one of the ride cars pushes us off. We can take a minute to appreciate our own graves, and you can legitimately take a short rest here. The zombies that look down on you won't attack, and you'll have an extended moment before the game moves forward. You might want to take that rest though, because we go right into the boss battle of this level. As her name suggests, Evil Marie lost her head, but was brought back in one piece by Carn Evil. If you've been paying attention throughout the manor, you can actually see a few depictions of her, including a crayon drawing and a painting of her as a child. Either way, she's now a magical zombie and she immediately goes after you with her axe. Unlike Krampus, who loops around his arena on a timer, Marie's fight will only progress with damage done. In the first phase, she'll go right at you, close up, before switching to a distance axe throw. You can shoot away the axes, but despite how satisfying a sound it makes, you're better off focusing on Marie to keep the fight moving. Next, you two will rendezvous on a bridge, and she'll go right back to hacking. At some point in this phase, you'll shoot off her dress. Whoa, what? She was wearing S&M chastity underwear under that. I can't say I'm not surprised, and it's definitely more funny than sexy. I feel Marie in particular would be censored if they remade this game in the current day. That or she'd be the most misinterpreted character. No worries about that though, as we have another axe throwing section, followed by the final close combat phase. This time we shoot off her face, revealing her undead skull. Feeling the breeze on her face, she retreats to above a well of magic and begins to throw concentrated sparkles at us. These just wreck our health, taking a whole third of a health bar. And her fire rate is pretty fast. Once you get to this stage, you have to bring her down as quickly as possible before she drains your wallets. Her death scene is likely to get this video demonetized. All we have now is the Freak Show. It's the Freak Show! The Freak Show! See the strange and bizarre! Step right up! We'd love to see you! We think you could be the star! <laughs> The Freak Show is exactly what it sounds like, and it doesn't take long for the titular freaks to greet us. First are these human-fly hybrids, however we'll talk about them in a minute. First, we get to throw up as the spinning tunnel entrance is fast enough to spin the camera around as we enter. It's neat to see Umlaut incorporated in the scenery like this though. We can also see some sneak peeks for the upcoming enemies. Speaking of enemies, the zombie and elf equivalent for the first half of the level is this pleasant set of fellows. Flapjack. They are two men joined at the navel, who will attack us with either a spiked club or a classic punch to the face. It's hard to hate these guys though, as they dance while waiting for their turn to attack and sound like Goofy. <laughs> to deal with them, we are given a new power-up, the flamethrower. Though, this one's more of a power down. While enemies can catch fire, they don't take burning damage. Add in that the hit damage of the flamethrower is less than a normal bullet, and the flamethrower is a downgrade. Thankfully, it isn't hard to waste all the ammo in a few seconds and return to normal bullets. 
just be careful not to hit Betty with it, as it's really easy to during this particular camera shift. Working our way through the freak show, we come up to the fat bearded lady. Or, uh, what's left of her? It seems she's been eaten by Maggot Mike. These giant maggots with old men faces. To make these guys worse, their advertisement depicts a little girl hugging one. Ew. It's implied that these are the maggots of Flem the Fly, the human-headed flies we've been killing. They have quite the eccentric expression on their faces and often wear hats that fly off as you shoot them. We can see them stuck to flypaper in the upcoming fly trap room, but keep in mind that this is a trap set up by the flies for us, and not the other way around. Immediately past the fly trap is the Museum of the Slightly Curious, which is filled with random neat things and references. There's a parody of the Cracker Jack Kid, a reference to Trog the Caveman, another creation of Jack Hager, a stuffed spider monkey that might just be a glitch, and various other knickknacks and references. Heading out back, we find the assistant to the suspiciously absent knife thrower. Some flapjacks attack us, including one that sends us crashing into the primate enclosure. We are swarmed by literal spider monkeys, though funny enough, some of them never attack us. We leave through the front door, freeing a bunch of monkeys as we do, and head on over to the Chamber of Horrors. Iclops is an interesting mini-boss. Unlike Hambone, he doesn't tear into your health or appear more than once. He is distinctively more interesting though, as he has an exaggerated British accent you want some of this English muffin? and a surprising amount of unique lines to say. He also has a fight gimmick, with his many eyes being his weak spots. This call for accuracy makes the battle just a bit more interesting, and I honestly think Iclops is much better than Hambone. Either way, once he's down to one or two remaining eyes, we may pass. Now, in an interesting move, the Chamber of Horrors is filled with two new enemies, these SM weirdos. In fact, most of this castle is a series of torture chambers. Environmental wise, the devs had some extra fun with the set pieces here. We have Betty in stocks, this fun little moment. Help me, help me. I don't know, Betty, you seem to be doing just fine. Oh, and there is even this guy in an electric chair. If you want, you can shoot his limbs off and play around with the gore mechanics a bit. We continue on though, into a strange room. There's a guillotine, but below it is a giant drain hole? We don't have to wonder for long though, as we are pushed down the drain and onto a conveyor belt. The machinery in this room is also a bit odd. From the belts, it feeds the torture chamber victims into a massive meat grinder, and the resulting mush is poured into giant toddler bowls? This is odd even for this game. We head outside through the back entrance and enter this level's boss fight. This is Junior, the big baby. He appears to be a parody of Frankenstein and is covered in stitches and burn scars. I don't like Junior. Junior is gross. That in mind, he starts the fight by hitting you with his rattle and kicking you in the face. He quickly runs off, knocking down blocks and chasing us into a giant dollhouse. He then proceeds to vomit on us because of course he does. To escape, we need to catch the train. Derailed, we are back in front of Junior's crib, where he starts attacking us with random items he pulls out of his diaper. Again, gross. As much as I dislike Junior himself, his fight by far has the most movement and unique set pieces. A lot of thought and care was put into this arena, and it definitely elevates the battle on a technical level. Either way though, it's time to end this. We push Junior back and into his electrified crib.
Man, they deep fry everything nowadays. Now that we've completed the first three levels, we've unlocked the final one, the Big Top. You've made it to our main attraction, the Three Ring Circus in the Big Top Tent. We hope our clowns will entertain you before making you the main event! <laughs> <laughs> The ticket office up front holds our first new enemy, a gnome-sized clown with a deep voice who brandishes a knife. They're backed up by the giant clowns who make comedic honking and squeaking noises, and wield either hammers or brass knuckles. We circle about the outer ring, passing by the changing booths, the concession stand, and mimes. In a brilliant move, the mimes don't attack. At all. Even if you blow off one of their limbs. You could spare them, but... I mean... They're mimes. Before heading on stage, we meet the bad boy Mortitos, who spouts Spanish and stab you with pitchforks. They apparently were designed by their voice actor, and you can actually see sneak peeks of them and the big clowns in the background of the Freak Show's first area. Unfortunately, the Minotaurs also advertised on the same wall are not in the final game. Either way, it's showtime. Clowns are popping out of giant hats, thrown at us from seesaws, and being fired at us from human cannons. All while Betty is running around like a chicken with her head cut off. Some really ugly poodles swarm us, and circus music plays like everything is as intended. I love it. Speaking of poodles, the bubblegum-flavored hellhounds sit right in the early 3D visual space where my brain just can't 100% comprehend it. Something about their rat faces and blue frilly collars. Still love them though, as in addition to attacking us, they do tricks, like jumping through rings of fire and doing flips. You don't even have to shoot the flipping ones. <laughs> They're just happy to be here. Now, our player character, if you haven't noticed, has a bit of a death wish. So we shouldn't be surprised when he jumps into a cannon and shoots himself to the tops of the trapeze platforms, because ladders are for pussies. We then put on a full acrobatic show, complete with swinging, tightrope walking, and even a full bounce off the catch net. And all of this is ruined when a bat boy manages to push us to the ground. Ow! No way we survived that. But at least the paramedics are here. Shrugging off our normally fatal fall, we make our way to the last ring of the circus. Turns out Token Taker has plans for us, or specifically our brain, and he wants it for a gorilla exhibit. Considering how Junior turned out, I doubt even King Kong fans would want this steal. While we are fighting these jam-filled doctors, keep an eye out for one of the chalkboards flipping. It reveals that the other monsters, or at least the clown doctors, think Umlaut to be a kiss-up. It's a bit fun to imagine what the creatures act like when there isn't an active victim in the park. This section is short-lived, though, as we are captured in an elevator. Welcome aboard. From this study, I have observed your every move. But you do not obey! Prepare to die! <laughs> Did you think we wouldn't fight the game's poster boy? That in mind, Umlaut's fight is a bit disappointing. Everyone's favorite floating clown head is surprisingly easy to beat, though that might be because they wanted people to stick around for the actual final boss. Umlaut will slowly move about in an X pattern, occasionally coming forward to take a bite out of the player. His bite can't be cancelled out, but he doesn't take a particularly large amount of health. When he dies, he reverts to lose polygons and ceases to be. Ah! 
Token Taker's fight is very cinematic, with most scenes progressing regardless of whether or not you hit him directly. When on screen, he'll fire at you with his blunderbuss, but most of the time you'll be fighting his summoned skeletons instead. You chase him across the whole Zeppelin. Even stopping to save Betty one last time. The battle is surprisingly long, and it culminates in Token Taker taking a final stand. Depending on how many hits you manage to get on him before this, he can easily have quite a bit of health during this final phase. He'll send fireworks and throw explosives at you, which will rapidly drain your health. You are likely to lose a full life or two on this battle, but what do you expect from the final boss fight? Eventually, we tear away enough of his health and flesh to send him flying backwards and into his Zeppelin's propellers, sending Carnival back where it came from. We write our names in the high scoreboard, and totally don't draw a bunch of obscene imagery which will be displayed for all to see on a regular loop, and are given eerily silent credits. These credits were likely silent as to minimize the sound on the already loud arcade floors, and we are shown the try again screen before being booted back to the attract demos. And that was Karn Evil. The music of Carnival is just as creative, sinister, and fun as the rest of the game. All the tracks are over the top and convey their locations perfectly. Special shout out goes to the Big Bunyan Ride theme. <laughs> show. The latter in particular gives off some serious Beetlejuice vibes, in a good way. One last thing before we head off. I want to talk about the game's excellent gore system and the censorship options. The game has put a lot of emphasis on its gore, and it often directly rewards the player for focusing aim by stripping limbs and faces of flesh, removing limbs entirely, and even some bodiless legs animations. This system applies to all enemies, which leads to a lot of fun and many neat moments. I really love the gore system in this game, as it's messy and detailed but not realistic, making it perfect for the game's dark comedy tone. Unfortunately, it is possible to turn down or flat out remove the gore in the game's options. Honestly, I doubt anyone is surprised about that, but it still feels like an insult to censor such a great system. While we are in the options, we can also remove the more rude teenagers at the food court, specifically the ones doing direct gestures. 
And last, I want to talk about a censorship option I actually like, but not for the intended reason. You can disable Big Baby, and in doing so, you replace Junior with an alternative boss, Deddy. I personally like Deddy. The raggedy old bear is a bit scarier than Junior, and I think he fits with the rest of the game's aesthetic a bit better. I will admit, though, that it takes away from the dark humor of the boss fight. This option to switch bosses was originally so an offended party can remove any infant-based violence from the game, which the devs feared would be a major turnoff for otherwise interested buyers. To be honest, I never saw Deddy in the wild, and I don't think Junior resembles a baby enough to get most people from that time's jimmies in a bunch. If you were punting infants who cooed and crawled on the ground, that would be one thing, but Junior? Yeah, nah. Personally, I prefer Deddy because human infants are literally disgusting. Like, I literally feel ill looking at them. I don't hate babies. In fact, I think literally hating babies is serious red flag behavior. It's just that human babies make me want to vomit. And Junior definitely doesn't help that. So while I'm normally strictly against censorship, I actually prefer Deddy for completely unintended reasons. And just for the fun of it, let's talk about Silly Hat Mode real quick. If you reload five times during Umlaut's poem before the haunted house, then when the level loads in, all the zombies will be wearing silly hats and wigs. Girly pigtails, full disco afros, tall American patriotic top hats, and stuff like that. It doesn't affect gameplay or appear in any other level. It's dumb, but fun. And I wish I knew about it when I had a chance to play this game in the wild. And with that, let's wrap this up. Needless to say, I am a huge fan of Carnival, and it's definitely held on to a strong, if small, fan base all these years. The game is extremely memorable, and I often meet millennials who had nightmares about this game, but can never find it again, often misremembering it as a House of the Dead entry. I hope I've brought some more awareness to this game, as it's a real shame how it's been forgotten by the general public. Now, some hardcore Carnival fans are probably going to leave some comments about how I didn't call all the characters their names, or how I didn't mention some specific bit of trivia, but I try my best to keep these videos friendly to potentially new fans. And that includes not scaring them off by talking about a bunch of unnecessary names that don't appear in the game. The fact that there is so much background lore is great, but it would benefit both this video and the game if I didn't nerd out in the middle of of the date. As always, I would recommend playing this game in the wild if possible. If it's not available, there are some cough cough means to play it, but I'm not giving a tutorial anytime soon. This will be my last review of this year. I want to spend some time with my family and get started early on next year. That and my computer has been replaced while working on this review, so to say I'm behind on everything would be a major understatement. If you want to see my old stream of this game from back in the day, I'll link that down below. I'll also be linking a channel that specializes in file rips of Carnival, as their website was a very helpful resource while working on this review. I will also be linking a 2019 interview with the creators of this game. If you are looking for more evil carnival slash theme park goodness, I'd recommend the song The Greatest Show Unearthed by Creature Feature, and the arcade rail shooter Haunted Museum 2, also known as Fright Fearland, which I will eventually cover on this channel along with its first game. And I think that's it. I'm gonna go now and visit my local undead carnival. Bye!
that went about as well as expected. 